everybody in my life had one or two symbols above their head and that was an X or a dollar sign and if I couldn't use you in some way, you meant nothing to me. I got caught up in a massive love triangle. She was in the process of a divorce and this guy was uh, abusive and he got hold of her one day and, and had her over to the house and I just flipped out and stole the gun from my mom and went and shot this guy point blank range. Didn't even care anymore. I was sick of people pushing me around. He was pushing me around. You don't do that to me. Things kind of started happening when I was probably about 10 years old. My dad was uh, pretty abusive as far as verbally and, and uh, physically abusive. And then, uh, you know, at school, um, I was short and had buck teeth, and um, I was getting bullied pretty bad. And uh, so I started getting a little bit of trouble because of that. And, uh, um, you know, the teachers started telling me that I was a, a loser. And then same thing at church. Um, my mom forced us all to go to a, a church and I started acting out in uh, confirmation class. So I got the finger pointing from them. And same thing from the Sunday school teachers that you're a, you're a loser, you're a troublemaker, you're never going to amount to nobody and you're going to hell. So I was 10 years old and already feeling like I didn't, I didn't belong anywhere. And uh, you know, when you're 10 years old and you don't want to be at home and you don't want to be at church and you don't want to be at school, it's like, where do you go? I allowed that to determine the next 33 years of my life and pretty much one of those, well, I'll show you. Some older kids from the high school next to the elementary school I was going to uh, we go in the tree line between our schools and smoke cigarettes and one day they uh, saw me out in the yard. Uh, they called me over and, and uh, they handed me a cigarette. And uh, I smoked a cigarette with them and they didn't call me names, they didn't abuse me, they didn't punch me. And uh, pretty much these, these kids started sticking up for me when they saw people messing with me out in the schoolyard and said, you, keep, you mess with him, you mess with us. Eventually I started selling dope at school for them at the age of 12 and 13 and um, already had a name for myself by then. From the time I was 14 until I was 18, I pretty much spent all that locked up. Um, everywhere from group homes, foster homes, treatment centers, and then eventually went to Lincoln Hills Boys School. When I was 18, I, I started getting into more and more things and ended up getting in a big sting operation here in Eau Claire. Um, my friend and I uh, robbed 250 homes from what the feds say in a six month period. Um, I ended up getting a 10 year prison sentence for that. I started getting deep, deep, deep into Satanism. I had an occult library in the prison system bigger than any that I have even had while I was out on the streets. I did most of my time in maximum security, so I had 23 hours a day, seven days a week to sit in my room and, and study this stuff and practice rituals. And um, it got to the point where even there was a lot of guards that feared me. Got out, got right back into the drugs, crack cocaine, doing all kinds of other drugs on top of that. Got caught up in a massive love triangle. Strung out and, and messed up on, on crack. Went and shot this guy, point blank range. My mind was even there anymore. This guy meant nothing to me. I tried to get rid of him. Um, I received 18 years in prison for that. Got even um, deeper and deeper into the occult. That's what I lived and breathed it. Everybody knew me by it. Got out um, in 2006. And this time, my, uh, my, my drug of choice was meth. The first time I took a hit off that meth pipe, I knew I was done for. Now, Eric was a, a kid that I met back in 1996, just before the shooting. He was 16 at the time, and I turned him on to marijuana, and he became a pothead. When I met him the second time in 2007, he was 27 years old, and uh, I turned him on to meth. So a few months down the road, man, you know, we're staying awake for six days and six nights on the drug and we're coming down off it and we dropped him off at his new apartment and I went back to my place and the next morning I got a phone call from his mom saying that he was at the Minneapolis burn unit and he probably wasn't going to make it and uh, so what happened was he put the mattress on the floor a little too close to the heat register and because he was awake for so long and the intensity of what that drug does to your body uh, he was already melted in the mattress before he woke up when the mattress started on fire. And uh, it was one of the hardest things in my life to forgive myself for because I knew I was responsible for it. 
all this time I built up this big badge on and thought I was this courageous guy and uh, everybody feared me and, and I used people, but I couldn't do this and I wanted to do that more than anything in life. And I, uh, I just said, oh, I'm just gonna die from drugs, man. And I just started taking so many drugs, I, I thought I'd just kill myself that way. And uh, I almost succeeded three times before my last arrest in 2009. 2009, I got arrested for running a drug house. So here I am sitting in jail again, looking at probably spending the rest of my life in prison. And uh, I was 44 years old. And just looking back on everything I had done and, and the life I lived, and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. There was a, a drug and alcohol program in the county jail. Uh, unfortunately, it was a faith-based drug program, and I uh, didn't really want to get involved with that, but I had come to myself enough that I was going to do whatever it took to, to do what I had to do to get clean. Long story short, man, I went in there, and you had to have a, a Bible in order to do the homework. And uh, I wasn't going to get caught with a Bible. Everybody seen me with a Bible. So uh, I went to the library one day and found one of those little pocket Gideon Bibles and stashed it down my sock and went in my room and threw it under my pillow. And when they locked down that night, I would bust that out and the, all the homework was all fill in the blanks. And then one day I was sitting there doing my homework and I came across this verse in Psalm 51.7. And it said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And anybody who's involved deeply with the occult knows that that is word for word part of the cleansing rituals and the, that we perform in the occult. And I'm like, what is that doing in the Bible? And uh, it went from me just looking in here to fill in the blanks to now I'm, I'm, I'm reading this. I came back to my cell one day and somebody had put the uh, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel on my floor. And after I read that book, it made this real. You know, the Bible says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and life. And because I was reading the truth, I came to know Jesus on uh, January 22nd, 2009. And where do you even go from there? It's been, what's eight years since I um, accepted the Lord in my life. I saturated myself with God's word the whole time I was locked up because I, didn't, I knew I wouldn't have that kind of time again. A year and a half after I was released, uh, the Lord sent me back to prison, um, doing jail and prison ministry. Uh, I, I wasn't wanting to go back. I had enough of that all my life, 27 years in prison, I was done. But he said, Brian, who knows you best? Where did you spend most of your life? And uh, I said in there, he said, and, and they all know how much you despised me and, and hated my people. And uh, you need to go back and tell them what I did and what I can do. So I've been doing jail and prison ministry since then. All I know is that the, you know, Man, 33 years of my life I was lost. I was in a dark, dark place. I was in a, a world of chaos and just insanity with the drugs and the prison and the jail and the crimes and the way I, I used and manipulated people. And uh, most everybody gave up hope on me. But I, I just want to be a picture of hope for uh, men and women and, and, and children even that are caught up in, in the addictions and the pornography and, and caught up in the criminal lifestyle and, and uh, whatever, whatever it is um, and thinking that there's no way out or nobody cares about them. Man, look where I was in my life. No matter how far gone you think you are, man, there is hope and that hope is to be found in Jesus Christ.